If you saw my last movie on building the sun terrace, and if not, the link is here, then you would see how I built the blockwork wall. In this episode, we're going to concentrate on the joinery and install the roof. My first job is to install the large beam at the front that supports the roof structure. The beams are constructed from 3x9s, and on the front corners they are overlapped with a dovetail. I figure the dovetail will hold all the structure together better than just a standard half lap. And once the dovetails were cut on the front beam, I used the offcut to mark out the cuts on the two side beams. All the joinery here was marked out and cut by hand with my trusted tenon saw and actually quite an old rusty Stanley Fatmax saw. I'm actually quite a fan of the Stanley Fatmax saws. Every now and again it's nice to have some traditional tools in your hand rather than power tools. Because all these timbers are rough sewn, I thought I'd just run the block plate down to take off the small spiky edges. And then, because I was working on my own, I needed to figure out a way of getting this beam in place. These beams are really heavy and this is the heaviest of the three that I will be placing on my own. In the end, I decided to roll the beam down the patio using an old section from an old garden seat method that is tried and tested over thousands of years. Once I had the beam rolled into place, it was just a case of bumping it slowly up the block walls. Please note, I'm pulling my best lifting face here. It gets the job done much better. Yes, please with that one. Once the beam was in place, I obviously just wanted it to stay there. So I clamped some 2x1 onto the block wall and then I clamped the 2x1 to the face of the beam. Please note, I fitted a 3 quarter inch spacer between the 2x1 and the block work. This is so the beam cantilevers out over the face of the block work, which will give me something to render up to later in the build. And before I could fix the beam permanently, I just had to ensure it was level and plumb. Before I could bed the beam onto some sand and cement, I wedged it up slightly at one end and then packed the sand and cement underneath. The pack was removed and the beam was lowered down back onto the sand and cement to find its level. Then the clamp was fixed back on to hold it while it's set. And then I repeated the process at the other end of the beam. Taking time to ensure the beam was perfectly level. The beam was fixed to the top of the walls further by the means of these 10mm threaded rods, nuts, large washers, some steel plates and an angle. The angle was screwed to the face of the beam, the rods and the washers were lowered into the hole at the top of the wall and then the whole assembly was concreted in. I tightened the nuts up further once the concrete had set. Now the front beam is set, I can take the dimensions for the two side beams. The two side beams are 3 by 10s the same as the front beam, and I cut these to length with my DeWalt and held circular saw. The blade was a little bit too small to go all the way through this timber, so I had to reverse the timber and cut it from both sides. Using the offcut I'd just made, and the dovetail shaped offcut I made earlier from the front beam, I marked out the dovetail half lap on one end. Unlike the front beam, where I cut it with my rusty saw, this time I cut the majority of the joint with my DeWalt circular saw, and just finished the joint with my small Irwin tenon saw. Next I need to cut a tenon on the end of this beam, so to ensure I was working with a squared and level beam, I lifted the beam in place so I could mark out the joint properly. 
I used a piece of wood to support the end until it was level and then make sure that the two beams was exactly square by screwing on a brace. Now I needed to mark out a piece of 4x4 that would form the upright at the house end and I wanted this piece of 4x4 to also support the end of the wall plate so I had to work all my measurements out from where my rafters would eventually be sat. It was a case of getting the beam in the exact position and then marking around it to ensure that the mortise and tenon would sit perfectly central in the 4x4. Whilst doing this I also marked out the positions of the fixings that would fix his piece back to the wall. As you can see here, I'm talking to myself, trying to make sure the dimensions are absolutely correct. Measure twice, cut once, or measure once, cut once, go back to the shop for some more wood. Once I was certain I had all these measurements, I could then transfer the measurements onto this piece of 4x4. These two pieces are tantalised. They are the only two pieces of the roof that will be exposed to the weather. And once I had finished the first side, then I completed the second side in exactly the same method. To produce the tenon joint on the end of the beam, I set my circular saw about half inch deep and made multiple passes across the face. I then paired the tenon cleat with a chisel. And to make the mortise pocket, I drilled most of the stock away with a 3 quarter inch spade bit in my drill before chiselling away the rest of the stock and squaring out the pocket. And once I had the mortise and tenon cut, it was just a matter of cleaning up the shoulder of the tenon. I also cut an half lap on the top of the post to secure the wall plate against the wall. This means I can fix the wall plate single-handedly whilst working up the ladder. To fix the post to the wall, I'm going to use 10mm threaded bar set in resin anchors. But before I drill the holes in the post, I needed to establish which size socket I needed to tighten up the nuts to the wall. Once I'd found the correct size socket set, I found the drill large enough to make a hole for that socket. And when I came to drill the holes in the wall, I first piloted them out with a small masonry bit and then enlarge the hole in the wall to accept the resin anchor and also enlarge the hole in the post to accept the bolt. I started this process with the bottom hole and then worked my way up the post. This method was a little bit long winded but it ensured that by the time I'd finished all the bolts lined up with the holes perfectly. This is the first time I have ever used resin anchors. At first I was a little bit sceptical that they would get a good bond, but once I'd inserted the basket and then the resin and left them to go off for 30 minutes, they was absolutely solid. I was amazed. And I spent the rest of the holiday telling everybody how good they were. Once I had got the post fixed to the wall, it was then a case of sliding the tenon into the mortise pocket and then dropping the beam over the R flap on the other end. This is the inside face of the joint. And once the beam and post are together, I could tighten up all the bolts. Next, I needed to fit the wall plate. As I said earlier, I had notched the top of the post just to hold the wall plate in place while I could get the chemical fixings in. I finished with the old wall plate, so this could now be removed. Because the longest beam I could buy was 5 meters, which is the same length as the concrete block work, 
In order to extend the roof beyond the walls, I needed to fit an extra piece of timber to the top of the beam, just to act as a cantilever. For the time being, this extra timber was left long. And along with some other fixings, this tied the side and the front beam together. Now, it's time to mark out the first rafter. This one was cut by hand. I used my bevel gauge at the wall plate to mark the plumb cut. And once I was happy with that, then I marked the bird's mouth over the top of the beam. When cutting a bird's mouth, it's important not to remove more than one third of the depth of the rafter. The first bird's mouth was cut by hand with my tenon saw and the chisel. Once it was cut, I tried it on the roof in multiple locations to ensure that the rafter would be replicated throughout the roof. It turned out I was a couple of rafters short, so when I popped down to the builder's merchants for a couple of rafters, I also filled the car boot full of roofing tiles. Here I'm setting out the roof tiles just to establish the overall length of the roof. I calculated I needed 380 tiles, so that was another two trips back to the builder's merchants. Now I knew the length of my rafter, my bird's mouth and my plum cut, it was time to make a jig to increase the productivity on cutting the other 14. I clamped my sliding bevel to my rafter and then clamped another piece of timber to the same angle and then screwed onto that timber a stop. Once I had created this quick jig, I could then cut all the plum cuts on the end of the rafter, my DeWalt circular saw. As the rafters were all the same length, to cut the bird's mouth quickly, I lined them all up, transferred the mark lines across, and then cut all the bird's mouth out with my DeWalt multi-tool and at long last the roof structure started taking shape. Now look at the difference in the sky on this day to the next day. The next day it poured all day. This was a real shame as on this day, I had the family coming to help me. There was no way I could get the central purlin up in the air on my own. So a couple of weeks before I started this build, I enlisted the help of my brother-in-law and his brother-in-law, Mark and Greg. So I needed to get this final rafter and two supports made for the central purlin before they came. And here I'm finding the centre point for the purling support. And right on cue, here is my help. Greg didn't realise there were a camera behind him, so I've got about five minutes of footage of his behind. This piece of timber I'm holding up here is the offcut off the side beams. I need to mark on it the degree of fall of the roof and also a pocket for the purling to sit into. Welcome to YouTube Greg. This piece of timber I'm taking down was just a representation of where the purling would be. Straight away I could tell things were now going to move quickly with the added help. The angle of the roof was cut on the supports with my DeWalt saw and just finished off with the hand saw. Then I cut the cheeks of the pocket on the evolution saw. And finally finishing the cut with the DeWalt multi-tool. And then for decoration, just free-handed a couple of splays down the side.
The pearl interports were screwed in with some 4 inch coach bolts and I let Mark have a play with the impact driver. And then came the main event to wrestle in the really heavy central purlin. There was no way I would have lifted this up on my own. And this is where the Evans really opened. I think I changed my clothes about three times during the course of the afternoon. As I had two helpers who were also getting soaked, I didn't film much of the rest of the afternoon. But by the end of the day, we had an eight foot section of roof tiled. But by the next day the sun was back out and I was back on the roof. The process was to fit these tongue and groove boards and then the tile battens on the top of that and then the tiles on top of that. I really wanted to apply some underfelt but I couldn't find a small roll. The only roll I could find was 400 euros and that was more than the tiles. In the end I figured the house doesn't have underfelt on so why bother putting it on a patio roof? The reason I'm fitting this tongue and groove board in it so you don't see the underside of the tiles whilst inside the terrace. However, they proved to be a real pain to fit. These were classified as seconds. And it wasn't that I was trying to be cheap, I just couldn't find any better quality ones. And getting the tongues and grooves together was an absolute nightmare. And you can also notice that Lynn and Mark are actually painting them as I'm putting them up. And maybe some of this construction of the roof is a little bit backwards. So while I have two helpers helping with the logistics of getting the tiles on the roof, it was too good an opportunity to miss. It's not often you can get to sit on the end of your roof. So a massive thanks to Mark and Greg for taking a couple of days out to come and help me, especially seeing they got soaked. And a thank you for Max the Spaniel as well, Greg's dog, for coming and keeping Gracie occupied. Okay, so this is Friday evening, the last couple of days of my holiday, and I'd just been down to the builder's merchant to get the rest of the tiles I needed to finish the roof. And as I said earlier, having people to pass tiles up on the roof is much easier than up and down the ladder every couple of tiles. I'm not sure I've ever been here and spent two full weeks on one project, but the result here is 14 days of labour. And if you wonder how much effort I put in, when I returned back to the UK and got weighed, I was £7 lighter. So we get to the final day of my holiday, the Sunday morning, and I'm just making some finishing touches to the roof and also making sure things will be safe whilst I'm not around. So all the overhanging timbers and beams are trimmed down to their final length and also the tongue groove boarding is cut back to the rafter. The overhang of rafters are also cut back. All these are done with my multi-tool. 
there is still more joinery to do but that will have to wait for another day. All this joinery though is cosmetic and not structural. The final job before I leave it is to finish the luxuring, the bits that weren't done prior to installation and to install some old guttering. This came off the house a few years ago and I've been keeping it just in case I required it. This is temporary but for now it will fill the water butts. That's it. I have a fully functional, if not finished, sun terrace. Thank you for watching and I will see you on the next video.